Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Professor Slavik Brisovich, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, to start the event. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here tonight and a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, this is the seventh year the Cambridge Festival Ideas uh, has been going, and it explores the rich contribution that the humanities make in particular to our lives and the 250 public events that are being held actually speak widely to the whole topic and the way in which the work of the, uh, the arts and humanities here in Cambridge pervade the whole uh, fabric uh, of our community as a university. But it's also a wonderful example of where we can integrate with the city, with the people here, with the general public, to actually enter into debate and discussion on really important issues. And they've gone on from the economy to international development, archaeology and conspiracy theories, everything you could possibly want uh, to hear about uh, has been there in abundance. And I'm delighted to say that even though it's a Friday evening, it seems that Europe can still stir passions. The festival continues to grow from year to year, and it, it's the support of our partners, uh, friends and research funders, I'm very pleased to see that many of you are actually in the audience today, that also make this possible. This particular topic is a very European panel, and it's going to be formed of John Wiles, of Marco Hafner, uh, Niki Kalasuni, and Julie Smith, uh, who will be in conversation this evening around this topic of the cost of non-Europe. It takes its inspiration from the RAND uh, Europe's recent report, looking at barriers uh, to foreign direct investment and non-tariff barriers uh, to trade at state, sector and at EU level. This report looks at ways in which large gains in EU GDP could arise from tackling uh, economic and political questions of non-Europe. In developing this story, the panel will offer uh, some uh, provocations in the ideas. I cannot imagine this panel to do anything else but. And they will have views which may be at variance with your views and at variance with each other. And I know that John will more than moderate a good discussion uh, thereafter. And I know that because our chair tonight is John as Wiles, is a Brussels-based uh, journalist of long standing including 20 years with the Financial Times as New York correspondent, Brussels Bureau and foreign news editor, and Rome correspondent. Um, so much so that he became deputy editor of Italian newspaper L'Independiente. His consultancy work in Brussels included uh, working with the European Commission between 1996 and 2001 on the design and implementation of the communication strategy for the launch of dare I say it, the Euro. Uh, he has since uh, 2004 contributed a fortnightly column in European Voice, a newspaper and online service provided by the Economist Group, and it is probably one of the leading sources of information, and particularly independent information and analysis on EU policies. So I'm going to hand you over to John at this point, and like the rest of you, I look forward to an interesting and very lively evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank 
Let me say what a great pleasure it is to be here and to thank uh, the university and uh, Rand and other partners for inviting me to take part in what, what for me is a, uh, what's the word, an absorbing prospect and uh, occasion. Um, and it's good to see so many of you here, but I guess if you title something, put the words in the title, non in Europe, you're bound to get a, a pretty decent turnout in this country. Um, I have spent an awfully long time in Brussels watching and writing and analyzing the activities of the European institutions, and um, you would hardly be surprised if I didn't think that on the whole they were a very good thing, uh, and you would hardly be surprised if I didn't think that um, the United Kingdom's place is in the Union, not outside it. So let's just get that out of the way. I'm <laughs> not going to pretend to be something that I'm not. Um, but it is uh, also a pleasure for me to be in Cambridge, where I think I've only ever visited twice in my life, um, and therefore, you know, have really missed some enchanting, I think, experiences and opportunities. But I, was, I had a sort of difficult upbringing. My, um, my uh, elder brother was a Cambridge graduate, uh, and our father seemed to think that actually the height of aspiration uh, must be to be a Cambridge graduate. Um, and he made it quite clear that that was the gold standard as far as he was concerned, and that um, therefore the expectation was that, that I gain admission here. Well, um, some of you may be familiar with the Peter Cook sketch in Beyond the Fringe, where he talks about, I have wanted to be a judge, but I didn't have the Latin to be judging. <laughs> well, I might have wanted to be a Cambridge graduate, but I didn't have the brain. <laughs> that term, uh, a, 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 a source of some sadness, but I got over it. Um, <laughs> now, the theme, our core text is uh, the cost of non-Europe. Um, and as uh, Boris has already, I think, said, and I want to emphasize, that uh, two or three things. One, this is not intended to be a discussion exclusively about Britain and Europe, although I'm sure <laughs> the topic will come up. It's not intended to be an academic, serious academic con uh, conversation about how you quantify uh, the costs and benefits of being in Europe. Although uh, Marco Hafner, our, uh, the co-author of the report, which is our key text, um, uh, has done, is an, econ an econometrician and has done a remarkable job um, in producing some figures that you'll be seeing. Um, it is actually also a very important intention, if we can pull it off, to actually look and talk about the costs of non-Europe in terms of what would the extra benefits be if we had more Europe. Um, and so uh, it's, it's an attempt slightly to switch the perspective from uh, the non-Europe. I mean, I don't know how many of you know, but the origin of the, the phrase, the cost of non-Europe, was a piece of work commissioned by the European Commission about 1987, uh, when the single market program was being launched. Uh, and they got a guy called Cecchini, a former commission administrator, to do the work, do the research. Uh, and in fact, uh, an old friend of mine ghost wrote it. But that, that started the whole business of um, debate and discussion about what Europe actually d delivered in terms of quantifiable value. Um, and the debate and discussion has con continued ever since, and tonight we're, we're being exposed to another uh, stage of it. Um, the, uh, there's up, just one other point I'd just like to get out of the way, because um, which is about St. Catherine's. Uh, identity is one of the themes of this year's Festival Ideas, as I understand it. Um, and I suddenly, very early this morning, I woke up uh, thinking about this occasion, worrying slightly about this occasion, and uh, I suddenly thought, St. Catherine, which saint are we talking about here? I knew there was more than one, so I went to the, the source of all wisdom, electronic wisdom, to Wikipedia, and I don't know how many of you know this, but there are 11 canonized St. Catherine's. Um, my surmise, 
given that this college was founded in 1473, is that it's Catherine of Siena, because she died, I think, in the 1380s. But I could be wrong, and I hope that at some stage the University of St. Catherine will enlighten us on its website, because that was the only grounds upon which I could possibly criticize it. It's a very good website. Um, so um, that is... Uh, one, that is a personal preoccupation out of the way. Um, now, our speakers are going to speak, uh, for, have been asked to speak for about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, and there may be a bit of badinage and exchange between me and them, and between them afterwards, but pretty soon afterwards, uh, I'm going to throw it open to all of you to ask questions and make comments. But if you want to make comments, please keep them as brief as you can. Um, I mean, it's going to be tough for me to control the speakers, uh, let alone you, so I need to have you on my side. I have on some occasions in the past um, used this system whereby if the speaker is approaching its limit, give him a yellow card, and if, if he or she exceeds it, then you're off. Um, but I decided I couldn't possibly uh, use that technique with these... Uh, this distinguished um, bunch of speakers we've got through this evening. Um, I don't know how much uh, opportunity you've had to, to learn anything about their CVs, but our opening speaker, Mark, uh, Marco Hafner, is an analyst in the Employment, Education and Social Policy Program at RAND Europe. And his postgraduate studies include economics and applied econ econometrics, and he holds a master's degree in economics from the University of Zurich. He is, by the way, a Swiss who speaks High German, Swiss German, Spanish, and have I missed one out? French. French, yeah, and English. <laughs> um, and um, his particular expertise in data analysis and econometrics, having undertaken extensive quantitative research on the topics of labor industrial economics. Uh, his broader research interests include top, uh, applied econ econ I have still trouble with this word, econometrics, health, industrial, labor, and international economics. One of the, I mentioned earlier that, uh, that uh, we're very keen to broaden the topic out from the purely uh, economic. Um, and, and the speaker who will follow Marco, uh, Nikki Katsaouni, is wonderfully equipped and qualified uh, to do just that. Um, she has studied psychology at Bedford College for Women, now Royal Holloway, before completing a master's in philosophy aesthetics at the Paris Sorbonne University, and then a PhD in political science at the University of Athens. She's a poet, a novelist, a lyricist, and art critic, with over 40 years experience, and has been secretary of the Cyprus National Commission for UNESCO and cultural counselor of Cyprus at the embassies of Cyprus and Athens in London. Um, she's authored numerous articles. She's been a magazine editor-in-chief art and social critic and broadcaster for 13 years with the Greek state radio and television. Um, I don't know how much time we've got, actually. I mean, your <laughs> list of achievements is really quite extraordinary. Um, um, she lives in Nicosia um, and was a lecturer on psychology and philosophy at the Pedagogical Ac Academy of Cyprus and on sociology of education and theories of communication and mass media at Frederick University. Her most recent role is as the chairperson of the jury for this year's theatre prizes of the State Theatre of Cyprus. I wonder what your hobby is. You must tell us. <laughs> um, our third speaker is, is, uh, is Dr. Julie Smith, who came, in, came to Cambridge in '97, where she's now director of the European Centre of Polis, the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge, where she's also a fellow of Robinson College. Uh, where she is a graduate tutor and director of studies. Julie read philosophy, politics, and economics at Brazenose College, Oxford. <laughs> no, pass over now. Um, <laughs> where she also completed her MPhil and DPhil in politics at St. Anthony's College. She was a Hanseatic scholar in Hamburg and taught in the International Relations and European Studies Department of the Central European University in Budapest. Thank God you've been around a bit as well. Um, <laughs> Dr. Smith was head of the European program at Chatham House from 1999 until 2003, and since 2003, she's been a city councillor for Newnham Ward in Cambridge, 
acting as an executive councillor for arts and recreation with responsibility for sports, open spaces and arts in the city. Do you ever have time to go to bed? I mean, no. <laughs> extraordinary. Um, uh, and yes, well, that's about it. The Queen <coughs> conferred upon... Oh, you're a baroness as well. I've forgotten this bit. Um, <laughs> yes, in September, the 12th of September, the Queen conferred upon her the title of Baroness Smith of Newnham, of Crosby, in the county of Merseyside. Are you from? Them? I am. Yeah. I went to university there. I couldn't get in here, you see. <laughs> so I chose the next best thing. I was rejected by Newnham College. Mm -hmm. I'm quite happy to have it in my title. <laughs> <laughs> that's better. That, that's put them in their place. Um, so they are a distinguished group. I mean, highly, with a, a, a tremendously deep and broad international experience and a lot of cultural uh, experience and uh, wit uh, and intelligence and knowledge to bring to this discussion. So, um, without, as they say, further ado, over to you, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, John, for this uh, extensive introduction. And I'm very pleased to be part of this panel of people with such a very interesting LCV. And also thanking Dane to give us the opportunity to present the results of a recent study we conducted at RAND Europe. Um, Dane asked me to kind of quickly uh, give a definition of what the cost of non-Europe means, but John already kind of stole my thunder a bit. But maybe just to brush up uh, this, this topic and then to kind of set the uh, um, scene for, for this study and uh, for this uh, talk and then the next uh, talks. Um, the initial motivation of the European project well, after the, in the aftermath of the Second World War was, was mainly political, but the economic rationale of further integration um, became an important driver in itself. And as early as in the Treaty of Rome of 1957, there was the notion of a, a common market where people and goods and, and capital can move freely within uh, countries in Europe. And the hope was that the single market will promote trade, competition, foster productivity, um, create jobs, but as well makes Europe a much more attractive place for, for investment. And this concept of the cost of non-Europe uh, emerged, as John said, in, in, in the early 80s, um, when the Commission of, at that time wanted to analyze what would be the potential economic benefits from the full completion of the single market in Europe. So in other words, what would Europe what would Europe may sound if, if we wouldn't have a full implementation of the single market? And that became the concept of uh, cost, the cost of non-Europe. Um, the, the lead of this um, research project uh, was an uh, Italian professor named Paolo Cecchini. And in 1980, 1988, they um, showed the results of this report, and they argued that the potential gains in the internal market could be as much as 6.5% on average in GDP growth for all the member states, but it has to be noted here that the member states at this time were only um, 15. To give you a quick introduction on the, on the European single market as it is today, it was established in 1992, and shortly after its establishment, a whole bunch of uh, legislation, about 250, uh, 280 uh, legislations were passed uh, to open up national markets, to create a, a common European um, framework, to kind of guarantee the, 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 the freedoms of, of, of the single market, which are the free movement of people, the free movement of goods, the free movement of services, and the free movement of capital. Nowadays, all the EU28 member states are part of the single market, as well as countries as uh, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. It's important to stress here that the completion, or the seamless completion of the single market is still an ongoing process, and there's a lot of market fragmentation um, in the market still there due to a lack of harmonization of legislation, um, standards, and, 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 uh, and rules in terms of uh, product standards and so on. And maybe to give you one little example, which I usually suffer in terms of a lack of harmonization of product standards on clocks. So every time in a hurry I run to the airport, I realize, oh, I forgot, I forgot my adapter when I go to Europe. So then every time I'm going to buy a very much overpriced adapter at the airport, and uh, over the years I, I kind of got a collection of, of all these different adapters. So this is one area where I personally would actually um, benefit from more harmonization in, 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 in the single market. Maybe just one other example where I recently 
had an experience with that um, different countries can still um, put different the leg EU legislation in a different way um, in, into their national context was when I applied for a mortgage in, in, in the UK. So I went to a mortgage advisor and the mortgage advisor said, um, look mate, you don't have a credit history in this country. And I said, yeah, what can I do to get a, more likely to get a credit? And he said, yeah, maybe you should put your name in the electoral register in your council. And I did that. Two weeks later, I got a re uh, letter from the council saying, yeah, dear Mr. Havan, thank you very much, but your nationality, Swiss, for Swiss is, not, is not eligible to be in this re register. They gave me also a list of, of, of uh, nationalities which are um, eligible, and these are the usual uh, European countries, as well as all the Commonwealth countries like Jamaica, um, Zimbabwe, and Swaziland. So in general, I had to actually pretend I'm from Swaziland rather than Switzerland in order to get more <laughs> Put the focus back on, on our study. Um, the European Parliament, um, at the beginning of this year, commissioned a, a series of research papers to assess the current state of play in the, in the single market and to assess current gaps and barriers that are still hinder the, the free movement of, uh, of, of uh, or, which still um, hinder um, the full implementation of the single market. And we got asked to do this analysis for the free movement of goods. This, is, this study is about the free movement of goods. And to this end, we conducted um, an econometric analysis using a gravity model of trade to predict the potential economic benefits for the re removal of trade barriers in the internal market. Uh, for, to that end, we, we combined data from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the OECD, which provides a rich data set on, on different indicators on, on product market regulation for, for the member states, uh, which includes non-tariff barriers or, or barriers to foreign direct investment, which I will talk in, in a few minutes about. And to give you an idea what the gravity model is, so the gravity model is a trade model that relates bilateral trade flows between any given pair of countries with determinants of trade. Determinants of trade could be the country size, so the bigger a country is, the more it trades. It could be physical barriers, so this could be distance between countries, so the more remote countries are with each other, the less likely they trade with each other, just because the trade costs are higher. There could be cultural barriers to determine trade, so this could be language, so countries which share a common language are just more likely to trade with each other because of that. There could be inherited norms, for instance, driven by countries have colonial ties, this could also affect um, trade between countries. Tariff barriers, could affect trade, but it's important to note that within the single market, tariff barriers um, don't play a role. And on a more global scale, um, those barriers have been banished due to the establishment of the World Trade Organization, etc. We also look at, or there are also um, barriers to foreign direct investment, which mainly play a role for um, trading intermediate goods. So these are barriers that hinder um, companies to buy equity across border and set, set up intermediaries and, and trade, for instance, intermediate goods back to their home country. And last but not least, non-tariff barriers, um, which in our setting are the lack of harmonization of product standards uh, between countries uh, and the acknowledgement of them, and also a different um, treatment of taxation of, of foreign suppliers. If you like equations, um, this would be our model. But don't worry, I don't want to torture you with, with all these equations. And what you should take away from this is that we found in our model that non-tariff barriers and barriers to FDI are significant deterrents of trade in the internal market. And what we did is we used the parameters of this model to predict what would happen in the, to trade in the internal market if we would remove those barriers. So this is what you should take away uh, from this slide. Um, we, predict, we predicted different scenarios of that. So on one, we, one scenario we assumed that, there, that all the barriers will be fully removed. But we also kind of, we also um, predict or estimated a scenario which is ra um, rather more realistic, where we assume there's some sort of natural regulatory stringency um, with regard to those barriers, and we benchmark this to the um, countries with the, uh, to the five countries with the lowest um, barriers according to the OECD. What we find is that well, our results suggest that the remo removal of FDI barriers in the internal market could boost intra-EU trade by about 81 to 98 billion in the longer term, which corresponds to a share of GDP of about 0.59%. With regards to the re removal of non-tariff barriers, we found that this could boost um, intra-EU trade by about 102 to um, 171 billion, which corresponds to a share of GDP of about 1%. 
on the national level, we looked at how, how are these um, effects distributed across member states. And what we found is that the newer member states, like um, Estonia, Lithuania, and, and Latvia, as well as Croatia, who gain most of the re removal of, of, of the trade barriers in regards to um, foreign direct investment and non-tariff barriers. And those countries could increase their, their trade by about more than 10% in the long run. And it's not a very surprising result, to be honest, because those are the countries which had initially the higher barriers. So if those countries remove the barriers, they were more likely um, to gain from it. So to conclude this, this talk, so what we find is that 10 years after intended completion of the single market, there are still potential gains um, from further integration, economic integration. And we found that if we would remove trade barriers in, into the market, this would create would have a trade creation effect of about 183 to 269 billion in the longer term. But this is not this is not the only aspect of the single market which still has potential for further integration. So other studies found that um, there's been some the potential from um, um, removing barriers into into market for services, which could be about 300 um, around 300 billion. Whereas there could also gains from, from the closing gaps in the digital single market, which, which mainly affects e-commerce across member states. And it, it's important to stress that our study um, is supposed to be a tool to foster the dialogue in the current public debate and to give some a toolbox of, or a tool of, of facts and figures which, which could foster um, this public debate and, and to give just a sort of a picture that we shouldn't only talk about what are the costs of Europe, but there could also be um, benefits of further integration. And if you are interested in our study, and um, this will be the the, the, web, uh, the the URL where you can find our study. And if you have further questions, that um, please feel free to ask in the next in the question and answer section, and also in, in the reception. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'll take you back sometimes to a lad who was around here, a lad of yours. He said, economics is a very dangerous science. He said something more. He said, if, economic, if economists could manage to get themselves thought as humble, competent people on the level with dentists, that would be splendid. <laughs> and this was your man of King's Cambridge, John Maynard Keynes. Economics then. Let's start with the humble and the basics. Ecos, home, household, nomics, nomos, nomos, the law. So economics started from the know-how of managing one's home. The locus, the habitat, topos, is at the same time very close in Greek with tropos, the way. Your topos has to do with your tropos, both of which define one's identity, i.e. Cyprus, my locus, was inhabited, the habitat two and a half millennia before Christ by the Greek Mycenaeans. Added to this, two millennia after Christ, that makes it four and a half millennia of history of what? Of race? No, I have no idea what the Mycenaeans look like. But it is a memory of trace. It's a memory trace. The Greek language and also the Greek music embedded in the language. The plethora of languages, dialects, accents, intonation, or even atonality in music, underlines the variety of peoples that make up their polis, politia. Identity, then, is a dynamic concept and quality, not an end in itself, but as a freedom to be, a tropos of being. It is not a fixed style. It is alluding to the topos, the place, the locus, 
but a way diluted over time into subways. Cyprus has a very centralized presidential system, not like Ireland, for example. But Higgins, the president there, is a poet, and he quotes Homer and classical Greek literature more often than many Greek Cypriot politicians do. The way people react to the crisis is important because this is how the politicians are penalized during elections. Then again, we have to ask whether the forms of freedom, uh, for example, governance, empowerment, and participation do enable some countries to do better than others. Ireland seems so. In short, one person's recipe of health is another person's poison. Some European countries, and I'm told the Troika themselves, sent to Cyprus after the UN, uh, the, the European Union financed Cyprus, were amazed to see how many Cypriots are house owners. Uh, the construction business, which is now dead, for at least three years now, was a thriving business because no decent person in Cyprus lives in a rented home. It is not done. Why? Because Cyprus is a small island. The only way not to perish in the face of adversity, either an invasion or a crisis, a financial crisis, was to own some land to cultivate and to be housed on it. I am told <laughs> Uh, that they were surprised, people coming from Europe, by this habit of the Cypriots to own a house. We must say that in Cyprus, uh, up to uh, about 15 years ago, or a bit longer, um, a family had to build a house for their daughter as a diary, a house, not to give them money, because a house is, is more security. Uh, if there is an adversity, you can sell the house, you can do something with the house. Uh, after 1974, with the Turkish invasion, one third of the population of Cyprus became refugees and put into camps. This was totally unacceptable because refugees were put into tents. Soon, however, houses were built. They called it the Cyprus uh, uh, miracle. They were built to receive these refugees, and in a few months, there were no camps and no tents. Living in a small island, land is of vital importance for the livelihood and security of people. Many Cypriot refugees came to England after the invasion. What was their first target? To own a house. My parents came to England too, much before. And the first week that she was older, my mother wanted to buy a house. So she went around in the car with my brother to find a house. And he showed her around and uh, she said, I don't like this. It is stuck with another one. I want a bigger garden. I want to have apples in the garden. And they went around for hours. And then she said to him suddenly, you stop here, stop. I like this house. We buy one like that. My brother said to her, mommy, this is the mayor's house, the mayor of London's house. You cannot have it Soon, as, as we said, uh, all the refugees in Cyprus were housed. Uh, my family then emigrated to England and like, uh, first of all, uh, my mother's concern was to have a house for her family. In 2003, the barricades set up by the Turkish army when they invaded Cyprus were lifted. The Greek Cypriots could cross over for the first time after so many years. They did so in thousands. They queued for five hours in the sun, under the sun. Some of them fainted because they were old. And they wanted to go and see what? Their house. They wanted to visit their house. 30 years on, they still make their way now, regularly, every Sunday. And they go to see their house. And they come back with photos of places on land memory traces, as I, as I call them, landmarks. Their home within a village, uh, but also a bridge, and also the fig tree, and also the water mills of Labithos. And the churches, my church, St. Catherine's 
in Famagusta. And it is St. Catherine's of, uh, of Siena, not of Siena. And uh, I have a close relationship with St. Catherine, although I'm not religious myself, because my mother, when I was in London taking my exams, and I was scared shitless every time I had an exam, she said, don't worry, don't worry. I, I uh, lit a candle uh, to St. Catherine. St. Catherine is, is the saint for women who are intelligent like you. So you go and do your exams and you pass. I passed. <laughs> so I have something with St. Catherine. The greatest problem to solve in the ongoing talks between the Greek Cypriots and Turkey since 1974 is the land problem. Economics is a dangerous science because it does not understand why some people cannot take it easily to the repossession, to the possibility of repossession as an idea of giving up their home. Even the homeless refugees refuse to give up their right to homeness. I want to refer to you the Millennium Declaration, paragraph six of the United Nations. Six fundamental values, freedom, equality, solidarity, tolerance, respect for nature, and shared responsibility. The financial crisis, Economic performance is anemic, around 2%, even with Germany in front of possibly a recession. This crisis affects the very social fabric and the security of our countries. The way we respond to this crisis is a lesson. Freedom, which means governance, empowerment, and participation, do enable some countries to cope better than others. Ireland, as I said before, is an example. Um, our countries cope better if they are pluralistic and proactive. Laws and regulations should not be enforced. If the target is the common good for Aristotle, Kalo Kaiathia, teaching virtue, RT, education and culture can be preventive. Otherwise, people lapse into favoritism, meritocracy, corruption, and violence. So participation and empowerment is necessary. Uh, I think Julie here herself is a very good example of what I'm saying. Um, aristocracy is, in a way, a kind of meritocracy. Because in a democracy, you have to have the best. Aristos means the best. Otherwise, we change into tyrants. Uh, like we said, it's happening in the Arab Spring. Uh, so we may change one tyrant with another unless we change the whole system uh, towards a democratic system. Education, culture, and ecology can be the foundations of an economy of people, of an economy of f -zin. I call it the F-economia, the economia for the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I thought when this evening was initially planned, I had a long talk with Dane and thought, ah, I'm expected to talk about the costs of non-Europe, and had expected to go back to the Cicchini report and look at that. My academic discipline, as you've heard, is about the European Union. But one of the little bits of my personal biography that didn't get into the um, very long thing that John read out was my first proper paid job while I was undergraduate was at London Business School where I did a project linked essentially to the costs of non-Europe, looking at the impact on the duty-free sector for the 1992 programme, the Single European Act, and what it was going to mean in practice for British business. And it's such a long time ago that computers existed, but they weren't very good. The internet, as far as I know, didn't exist at all. And it was an extremely slow process of going to travel agents and collecting brochures about <coughs> travel to Ireland or to France or to other places 
and looking at the costs of trips and looking at the cost of duty-free goods. And on the basis of that, we began to plot how much for each journey a company was likely to make. And so from a very small project, the London Business School developed something that was slightly larger, but very much linked to the practical costs of non-Europe. Now, of course, new undergraduates at Cambridge will arrive and have no idea that there was ever any t tariffs based uh, across borders within the European Union. To them, it's entirely normal to go across borders without asking any questions, without their passports being checked, unless, of course, they want to come to the United Kingdom, in which case their passports are still going to be checked. But broadly speaking, the costs of non-Europe, getting rid of barriers to trade in goods, has been a phenomenal success. And it's, it's a success that was pushed in part, not solely, but in part, by the United Kingdom and by Margaret Thatcher. So just occasionally, the UK plays a constructive role in Europe. But yes, it, it is occasional. And at the moment, you might have forgotten that Britain has ever played a positive role in Europe. But we did in the middle of the 1990s. And if you read her memoirs, Mrs. Thatcher did say she was a pro-European. Again, you might not remember that. But I wanted, once I discovered that we were thinking a little bit more broadly and thinking about culture and other aspects of non-Europe, to suggest that there is another aspect of Europe that we should think about. And that's the vision of Europe that has meant peace, stability and security since the end of World War II. And at the time, when Halloween tonight, the fact that people are here at all and not out tricking, treating, or maybe you're here trying to avoid your um, <laughs> ch ch children and neighbours. But Halloween, moving into the month of November, which is always the month of remembrance, and the idea that we were poppies remembering that first Armistice Day of 1914. But we're in a continent that was ravaged by war, for generations. The end of World War II and the vision that was brought by Robert Schumann, by Conrad Adenauer, by Jean Monnet changed the face of Europe for many generations to the point where if you're under 80 and you're male and you're British, you didn't face conscription. And I realized it's a little bit different. And Marco, as our Swiss representative, actually <coughs> did have conscription. Were you part of the Swiss Army? Yes. yes, yes. And so there's a slightly odd situation where, for the UK, one of the visible signs of the end of hostilities, the peace after World War II, was a move to a situation where men didn't expect to be conscripted, where wives, mothers, daughters didn't expect their men to go away to war. And to the extent that people go and fight now, it's because they've chosen to join the army not because they've been forced to do so, not because there's a war in continental Europe. And one of the key things, therefore, that I think matters about the existence of the European Union and one of the costs of non-Europe were the European Union to disappear overnight is that it has brought peace and stability to Europe. It wasn't simply a visionary idea of Monet and his colleagues. There was an economic aspect to it already, right at the outset, creating a coal and steel community. France wanted access to German coal. So it was pragmatic, it was economic, but there was also an element of vision about it. And we're in a situation in 2014 where war, as Schumann had hoped, is now materially impossible among those states that are members of the European Union. And yet we don't need to look very far to the east, to our eastern borders, to realise that war isn't necessarily very far away. If you're in Ukraine, then your stability and security are not secured. There have been recent incursions from Russia. And if you're in the Baltic states, despite membership of the European Union and of NATO, there is still, at times, existential concern that maybe they're not so from Russia. Now, the Article 5 NATO guarantee will ensure that the Baltic states are secured. But there is a very clear change between the period before the creation of the European Union and of NATO and the present, where we assume peace. 
And in particular, we assume a very strong, positive, constructive relationship between France and Germany, the two countries that had so often been at the heart of wars. And now we assume they are close allies. Since 1963, they've had a treaty of friendship and reconciliation. Conrad Adenauer and General de Gaulle worked closely together. But the most iconic of the relationships was Helmut Kohl with Francois Mitterrand, where they thought of themselves as close friends, where they held hands at Verdun, where they really represented peace in Europe. And that, to me, is the most important part of European integration. Economic integration matters, but peace is really what drove the process. But one country, of course, remains very much on the margins. And I don't mean Iceland that was up on Marco's map earlier. Clearly, the United Kingdom is a country that is not at ease with Europe. And we heard earlier about barriers to trade. There are also barriers to integration. And for the United Kingdom, it is very much, I would suggest, a psychological barrier. That for many, the English Channel, despite the existence of the Channel Tunnel, the English Channel for some is wider than the Atlantic. Mentally, psychologically, culturally, there is a sense that somehow the United States is where we're at and Europe, in inverted commas, is many miles away. Despite the fact that Britain did join the European Union community in 1973. We've had 40 years of membership. You might have expected us to integrate by now, but we don't seem very comfortable. And we're led to believe by those in UKIP and some in the Conservative Party that we'd be better off out, that the costs of non-Europe are worth having, that <coughs> all the figures that Rand can put together or Paolo Cecchini put together 25 years ago mean nothing, that having British sovereignty would be more important, by having our own autonomy returned to us, we'd be better off. Well, I would like to suggest that Britain wouldn't be better off out, and I apologise for a little bit of parochialism. I know the idea is that we're talking generally about the costs of non-Europe, but Britain outside the European Union wouldn't be greater Switzerland or greater Norway. We don't have the assets either in the banking sector or in coal, uh, sorry, in oil and gas that Switzerland and Norway have. But we do have a very strong financial services sector, which is far better in the European Union than outside. And one of the reasons the UK benefits from foreign direct investment is precisely because Britain is part of the European Union. If we leave, we can't suddenly have all the benefits of membership without the price. Switzerland and Norway contribute to the European budget. It's not a free ride, but they don't have any say in decision making. The UK, yes, we contribute to the budget, but we get a rebate, quite a hefty one, and we have a seat at the table. Leaving would ensure that the UK was an island without too many allies <coughs> in the margins of Europe. And we wouldn't easily be able to renegotiate all those free trade agreements from which the UK benefits as part of the European Union. So from a British perspective, we're better off in. But from a European perspective, I hope that the benefits of British membership of the European Union are also considerable. In terms of military and defence support, we do work closely with the French. We have strong links with Germany. We play a major part in being part of the world's largest economic community. So the costs of Britain leaving and changing Europe would be considerable. The costs of non-Europe at all would be more than just financial. They would potentially change the whole nature of the European continent as it's developed over the last 60 years. And it would damage all of us, I think, very significantly. Thank you very much. Well, we've had three very different contributions, all of them extremely interesting and absorbing in their own way. Um, I mean, I could spend uh, a few minutes draw drawing some common threads, but I'm not going to, um, because I'm hoping that uh, you can see some um, evidence that obviously we've been talking about values, 
we've been talking about, certainly economic, attributable economic benefits, um, but we've also already widened the discussion into uh, areas of democracy, identity, security, and safety. Um, uh, the, the issues and problems associated with being European are uh, extremely uh, difficult and complicated. Um, there's nobody I know who, these days, who, um, and I know a lot of Italians, for example, who traditionally are the most passionately pro-European, um, who have more criticism of the Union than they've ever had, um, but would never, ever dream, uh, apart from a few lunas in the north of Italy, of arguing that the country should leave. Um, and I just wanted, to, Julie, if I could just come to you for a second, because the last, your last remarks, uh, I thought, were significant and very necessary. And I just wonder whether you could expand a little on what you think the effect on Europe and the future of the European Union would be if the UK were to withdraw. Do I need the microphone? Yeah, you probably do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the bottom line, in some ways, slightly cynically, would be the bottom line. Despite the best endeavours of the Prime Minister and some of his predecessors, the UK does make a significant net contribution to the budget. But that's very much at the cynical accountant's view of Europe. In terms of Britain's relations in the world, I think the fact that we are part of the Commonwealth linked to the United States through the five eyes in terms of intelligence and security makes a difference. I think for the United States, British membership of the European Union is important because it gives that bridge to Europe. But also for the Europeans, having the link to the US is also important. And the idea that somehow we walk away and we keep those relationships doesn't work for the British side, but it also weakens those links for the Europeans. I think in terms of Europe being a global player, the UK actually does bring some significant defence and military capabilities, enables us to speak effectively in the international arena. We would be stronger if Britain, France and Germany spoke with one voice more frequently, but the fact we're there very often working with France can play a key role. And then in terms of the wider patterns of trade, actually having the large British market is also important. So if Britain leaves, we end up with a Europe that perhaps begins to look in on itself a little bit more. And would it hold together? It would hold together better than if Germany were to leave. If France or Germany left, I think the edifice would crumble. If the UK left, the European Union would persist, but it would be significantly weakened, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nikki, uh, a slightly kind of wicked thought came to me. Um, uh, in the sections of your, your, your talk about uh, Cyprus. Um, is what happened to Cyprus a cost of non-Europe? If it is a cost of non-Europe, then it is... Would the invasion of... It is really people? a very bad cost <laughs> of Europe and Cyprus as well. I mean, my point is that if, if, if uh, uh, Cyprus had been a member of the European Union, the communities it was in the 70s and subsequently, um, would the Turkish invasion have been conceivable? I don't think so. And uh, this is a good question because um, the main reason Cyprus joined the European Union was not uh, a financial or economic reason. It was a political reason. Cyprus was doing well financially and it really needed to be in, in a bigger political family. And uh, this was what uh, made the European Union a very popular, uh, besides one party in Cyprus. All the other parties, the political parties, were in favor of joining the European Union. And there was a lot of people who, who spoke in favor. Um, it was a bit like bitter, bitter lemons, <laughs> not to say bitter grapes. Uh, what happened in Cyprus in, in, 19, in 2013 because the bail-in system, which was tried as an experiment for the first time, i.e. For, for a country to finance itself, 
confiscating, I'll use the word confiscating, the deposits of people, immigrants who worked for 40 years in fishing ships in, in England and going back to Cyprus to, take the, to stay there the last years of their life, they saw all their money confiscated. And it was really tough because it wasn't just uh, uh, Russian oligarchs who were in Cyprus. There were Cypriot people who really financed these, uh, these banks. I mean, the Bank of Cyprus and, and the like uh, were the traditional, very blue chip banks. And all the money of the people were taken. There is a crisis and there is unemployment. In, in four years, it was, it, it became, four times as much. I went to Cyprus 2010, and uh, unemployment was 2%. In four years, it became 14%. Let me stop you there. Thank yeah. you. Because I want to ask um, Marco, um, uh, you praised the progress made in creating a single market, but you also acknowledged the uh, some of the failures, really, of, of harmonization, the fact that it is still incomplete, mm. and, of course, above all, in the services sector. Um, there is, as it were, in, in pro-European circles, of, which are very large in Brussels, uh, a constant uh, complaint about national selfishness. Um, uh, in other words, a, an unreadiness to, to make compromises and perhaps even to take a few hits on the trade front in order to move the single market further forward. Um, I mean, what is your view of, of the, the failure to complete and therefore the costs of, of non-Europe that uh, we've been talking about? Oh, you've, got, you've got one. Right. Is on? Yeah. Yeah, I think, John, one thing that we found is that in, in, on the European legislation front, many legislations are set are so-called directives and directives give member states some sort of leeway in how they implement um, the regulation from, from, from the European Union in the national context. And in that case, I mean, member states have leeway in, or if they have some kind of options to, to, to change the, the legislation in a certain way, they can do that in, the, in, in their favor. So for instance, one member state could say, okay, we have a certain product standard, but because we want to um, protect our companies, we could, we could just add an, an additional standard on it that another um, a company from another, another state, member state, needs to comply to sell the product to our market. So in that sense, with, the, with a directive or with this um, framework of directives, um, member states can be in that sense selfish and, and this could actually harm the integration of, of, of the single market. On the other hand, in our study, we find that um, another um, aspect of regulation on the European, um, um, on the European level are regulations, and regulations are a set of uh, legislation which are binding in all the member states um, completely. So there's no way a member state can actually change the regulation to, to, to in their favour. So we found in our study, and, and that's the result I haven't presented here, that that, that actually can increase trade. So if you really put a, a certain binding legisla legislation or regulation on, on a certain aspect of a sector, for instance, that actually can, can foster trade, Exa exactly because of this reason that a member state doesn't have this, this, this leeway anymore to, to change the regulation to, to their favor, and, and, and I think that's quite a strong, strong result. Thank you. Okay, well, I, it's, uh, it's your turn. I mean, if, um, first of all, just to remind you, if you don't want to be on camera, just say so beforehand. Um, uh, secondly, to remind you to keep any comments brief. Um, thirdly, if there's really an avalanche of questions, then I may group two or three together um, because there won't be time for everybody to get individual answers. Um, can I have a show of hands, please? People who think they might want to intervene and ask a question. Hello, everybody's sort of still reading that. Let's, let's start with the two gentlemen at the back there. Okay. Um, my question is to the whole panel. Raise your, keep your voice oh, Sorry, okay. my question is to the whole panel. Um, and I asked the question as someone who is very much in favour of the European project. Um, but it's part of the problem with the European project today is not so much the British attitude towards it, 
but the reaction of traditionally pro-European countries to what's going on economically, places like Italy, like you mentioned, like the rise of the AFD in Germany. And I wonder if really European politicians expect Britain to be anti-European or Eurosceptic to some extent. But what has been a bit of a surprise has been the reaction of traditionally very pro-European societies and the sort of backlash against the austerity politics, which has now been really associated with Europe as a whole. Mm. Thank you. And is it? Yeah, just the other thing. My question was more to do with the um, media and the way that Europe is portrayed by the media in our country, because obviously the vast majority of um, print journalism is anti-European. Um, and my question is, will it ever be possible for um, the discussion in our country to be a positive one about Europe? Because it's always so negative um, about, um, you know, if you watch um, any episodes of Question of Time, the vast majority of politicians are on the back foot about Europe, even the most pro-European Liberal Democrats. So how will it ever be possible for us to be more, more positive about the European project? Very good question. Mm. Very good question. Mm. How long have you got? Um, <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Julia, do you, want, do you want to pick up the point about the backlash, the growth of these Eurosceptic parties around the Union? Way back in the early 1990s, there was a suggestion that Spain rather liked the British attitude to the European Union because it enabled Spain to hide behind us. So if we were being awkward, Spain didn't need to be. And I think for a long time there has been more Euroscepticism in some of the other member states than anyone's wanted to talk about. The backlash is, I think, very much to do with a lot of the Eurozone architecture, to use a horrible phrase. And I think there is a real problem about the complexity of a lot of the responses to the Eurozone crisis. So if you talk to members of the centre-left parties, the Party of European Socialists, the S&D group in the European Parliament, there is some real concern about the changes that have been brought about because they appear sometimes to be undemocratic and unaccountable. So I think there's some work that needs to be done in that area. And if I could very briefly just link it back to the media issue, I think some of that is a problem in other European countries as well. There's an issue of needing to put across clear, effective messages. The problem in the UK is that politicians, pro-Europeans, for the last 40 years, since the 75 referendum, haven't spent very much time saying why Europe matters, how it's important to people, what the visions and values are, and hence being always on the back foot. If you don't start hearing positive voices now, then we will leave the European Union. We absolutely need the clear voices, and they need to come not just from politicians, but from vice chancellors, from business people, from anybody that makes a difference. And if that's footballers who actually benefit perhaps from free movement of people, let's to the colours as well. Thank you. Um, if I'm en passant, I might just do a quick response as a media man myself. Um, uh, I think the answer is no that in the classic written media. Um, but I think that the, the new media, social media, blogging, all of the opportunities for self-information and participation, self-informing, on the web actually are going, is, could change attitudes through time because, through time because um, purely because people can be better informed, can uh, in the end uh, question the kind of facile, prejudiced approach you get in a lot of European coverage. Um, uh, a lot of it, by the way, I have to say, um, the origins of it are that... Uh, there was a tremendous enthusiasm in the media when we joined in '73. There was, it was an enthusiasm which was sustained by Margaret Thatcher's campaign to reduce Britain's budget contributions. So handbagging metaphors and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, Britain was going to, to war with the continent or the baddies on the continent virtually every month for every twice a year at European councils. So that gave them an exciting story, far more exciting in the end than the single market and the subsequent 90s, which are rather quiet, when Blair should have been making speeches about Europe and wasn't. Um, but then what really gave them red meat was some really minor scandals, uh, or minor scandal affecting one commission headed by Santerre, which had to resign early. Um, 
And uh, suddenly, reporters there get the attention of their news desks by writing stories about corruption, um, false accounting, and so on. And that really, to, to my mind, has, has, has got, had got a bandwagon going, which then was played on, played up by the right wing of the Tory party, um, not to speak of, and we will speak of, people want to immigration, but I've, I've said enough, I'm supposed to be chairman. Um, uh, uh, um, Thank you. Yeah, I know. What I wanted to ask you, is there any backlash in, uh, you, you talked about the suffering of the Cypriots. There is a backlash in Cyprus <laughs> with regard to youth unemployment. Now, this is a very serious problem for, uh, for countries because we, we feel that we are losing the next generation. There is nothing for us to keep our brains, the, 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 real, the real power of a country, the manpower of a country, we cannot keep it in place. And they are seeking to go out of the country. What do we, what do we create with, with the crisis? We create uh, impoverished uh, peoples uh, with pensioners whose pensions are being cut and the young generation going abroad. And this means that there is a chain reaction in all the membership, in all the, the, the member countries, because immigrants go from one country to another country. So there is a problem in the other country as well. So uh, for me, the backlash of, of the whole situation is youth unemployment, and we can fight that only with cooperation and with solidarity between all the member states. Thank you. Just briefly, are the Swiss bothered about having to adopt European regulation, but having, not having any role in negotiation? I think I wouldn't say they're bothered, um, because I think Switzerland is one of the countries who might never ever join the European Union, because just, I think, as you say, it's kind of a weird concept, um, what Switzerland does. So they're part of the single market. They have to transpose all the legislation that comes from, from from Brussels without having any say in it. Um, they're part of, they pay into the cohesion funds in Europe, but they don't want to be part of the European Union. So it's totally not rational why Switzerland wouldn't, wouldn't join the, the European Union. But I think one, one interesting part of it is that Switzerland or Swiss people, they, they don't want to be part of the political integration, I think. And the reason is why is that Switzerland has this very beautiful thing of direct democracy. So we can basically vote every eight weeks. I get a letter at home where I can say, where I can vote of whether I should build a football stadium in my local authority, which I don't even live anymore, but I can say, oh, maybe my favorite football club should have a new football stadium. Then on the more national level, we can, we can decide whether we want to have six weeks of holidays rather than only five, which actually got rejected, uh, surprisingly. Um, but it's just the way that I think people in Switzerland are, are really, really scared to lose this kind of precious little thing of direct democracy. They don't want to put this sort of, of, of having a say. They don't want to lose that. And I think that, that is one of the main drivers why, why maybe Switzerland doesn't, doesn't want to join the Union, mm -hmm. even though economically and, and it, doesn't, it just doesn't make, make sense. It's not rational. Gentlemen up here, and I saw, did I see somebody? Sorry, who are you pointing at, Carla? Ah, yeah. Okay, well, the gentleman up here, and then I'll come down. Uh, can any of the panelists please comment on the cost of non Europe to science and academia? Yeah. Um, yeah. The European Union is uh, quite unpopular, clearly, with a lot of sections of the population in many countries. And one response to that is to uh, try to persuade people of the benefits of the union. Another response would be to devolve some of the powers back to nation states and allow them to do to deal with some of the, the complaints that are against the European Union. So my question is, is that an impractical option? I mean that's what our Prime Minister is claims to be trying to do. Fine, okay, well let's um let's deal with this. The, the cost of non-European science uh, and research and development. Um, do I have any offers here? Again, I mean, just sorry when I'm offering you an example of Switzerland, but there was just a recent case, you may have heard it in the media, that Switzerland voted to um, introduce immigration quotas, um, which is against 
that you were treating are, so it's, it's hindering the free movement of people. So what happened is that the European Union cancelled um, the access of Swiss students in the Erasmus program, and it also cancelled the, oh. the fact that Swiss researchers can be part of, of, of European funds. So, and Swiss researchers are complaining a lot because they don't get access to funds anymore, they don't have access to European networks anymore. So if you ask them, I think the costs are, are tremendous in terms of research and, what, and science. What, um, what proportion of total R&D spending in Europe is European as opposed to national? Oh, sorry. Just can... Don't know. Okay, sorry. I wouldn't know the answer to that. So the answer is 10% of all European R&D's funding is directly from Brussels. The other 90% sits in European nation states. The total cost for Switzerland that you've described is if Lausanne or ETH now want to have a European grant, they have to be a subsidiary to Cambridge or to Oxford or to another institution if they actually want to have a European grant. The total cost to science is at the moment it's 80 billion euros is actually the science budget till 2020 in a variety of formats. For this particular institution, the totality of Europe now comes to this single institution. For us, it's 20% of Cambridge University's budget is the direct cost to our staff here in, uh, in uh, Cambridge. And as I often have said, by all means, please feel free to come out of Europe, but do please tell me where I'm going to get one-fifth of the R&D budget back in order to sustain this city's position as an R&D leader in, in the uh, world economy. Isn't that also true of Imperial College? I mean, uh, no, I'm afraid no. Uh, it's, uh, it's about 14% for Imperial College. Um, uh, Cambridge is the leading single institution mm -hmm. in Europe for both ERC and uh, and also the top institution in Europe for mm -hmm. Framework Programme 7 funding. Oddly, in what is seen as the most Eurosceptic of all countries, mm -hmm. the top four institutions yeah. in Europe are all United Kingdom, yeah. um, but we tend to be ahead of the uh, other three. And, uh, I mean, now, now we've got you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what... Um, what have been the benefits of 10% uh, of total expenditure being done at a European level, both current and prospective? What can we, what, how can we expect things to get even better? So if I can just go back to my previous yeah. role before coming here to Cambridge, I was head of the Medical Research Council in the United Kingdom. What that actually means now, and particularly with the new changes in Horizon 2020, is we can now build coordinated large infrastructure Large Hadron Collider does not happen without the European Union funding. No large-scale project like the large observatory that's being built uh, in the Andes would happen without centralised coordination, which is actually managed through uh, European Union structures. There are many that we would argue about that we would like to see them better, but from my point of view, it's essential we're around the table to help improve uh, those structures to prevent, for example, the idea of individual nation-state protectionism so that we actually have quality, but we have to be sympathetic to the fact that other countries are desperately trying to bring their standards up um, in, in this uh, area. And we believe that should be done through structural funds, not by direct competition or privilege given to, uh, to shared funds of the European Union. So at the top end, Without those coordinated funds, large-scale projects which keep Europe competitive mm -hmm. with China, with North America, are all happening because the European Union enables those to happen. Okay. Without it, no single country could build a large Hadron Collider. That's fascinating. Thank you. But uh, just the last question. Um, we're still talking about 90% being spent at national level. Yeah. Does that not mean fragmentation, duplication, uncoordinated effort? In other words a lack of realisation of anything like the actual potential. So actually I would disagree with you that all of those are necessarily bad things. In science duplication is a good thing because it cross checks and secondly the idea of bottom up uh, thinking is actually where Cambridge has always been that we want ideas coming in a fragmented way because actually that's where the big new ideas actually stem from. 
what the 90% does is paradoxically, you may think that's not coordinated, but I was involved in the setup of an organization called Science Europe, which brings together all the funders that control the national budgets. And they sit there in Brussels as Science Europe, being able to debate with the European Union the wider complexity of how national uh, programs can also integrate more effectively with the, uh, with the wider European Union project. So for science uh, technology, this is one of the areas where there almost is, even if you pulled out of the European Union, you'd have to recreate this science and technology enterprise if you wish the European sector to remain globally competitive with North America um, and particularly with the East. Thank you. Now, um, uh, Repatriation of powers. Can we can we do it, and will it? Uh, uh, sorry, I, let me just uh, sharpen the question a bit. Um, Would you conceive that a negotiation on moving powers back to all governments, obviously not just the UK, uh, the, the concessions available would be enough to satisfy? The problem that Angela Merkel has at the moment is she doesn't know what David Cameron wants. And the idea that you can negotiate or renegotiate without having clarity about what you want is a little bit difficult. The balance of competences review that was in charge of the coalition agreement and is coming to an end um, has gone through all the areas where the European Union has competences and on the basis of extremely thorough evaluation seems to have found almost no areas of European policy where the UK would actually want to repatriate power. The, the general view for all policy areas, including, for example, the Department of Health, not very much is done at a European level, but where they've looked, the general view is most of these things are about right. The issues then become one of the key, the key things that the UK wants to repatriate, or at least David Cameron may want to repatriate and certainly wants to change, is free movement of people which is one of the four freedoms enshrined in the founding treaties, is a crucial analogue to the Single European Act. Goods were the key thing in the 1992 programme, but free movement of people is vitally important. And the idea that you can unpick that requires unanimity among 28 member states, and for all of them to ratify treaty change is going to be a bit difficult. So I think there might be some things at the margin that perhaps could be renegotiated as part of a package deal. But the big thing that Cameron may want in terms of changing rights of free movement, I can't see how he's going to achieve it. But until there's a point where there's a piece of paper where everyone knows what the requests are, the danger is we end up with another negotiation that is fantastic for the media because they show David Cameron having another fight, doing another press conference, trying megaphone diplomacy. But actually what he needs to be doing is having private bilateral conversations with other EU leaders, discussing the possibilities and also explaining the real difficulties that he faces with his domestic party as well as with the voters. But also bearing in mind the other 27 member states have electorates as well. And the idea that you just hand thing back, things back to the UK because we're threatening to leave, eventually they're going to say, Maybe you should go. We'd like you to stay. But unless you're actually going to be constructive, then maybe we do see the work. We, we do see you leaving. So we need to be a little bit careful about what we wish for. Thank you. I, um, can I put a question to the audience as well? Um, to what extent do, uh, do people think that um, the supporters of the camera line, let's call it that, as opposed to the UKIP line, which is not yet, uh, which certainly is making a big issue of immigration, but not, um, but where, and, and we know Cameron now is, but he's, his, his attitudes are unknown as to whether he wants to stay in Europe or not. But the point of the question is, um, is the support for doing something about immigration uh, a cultural, a British cultural reaction to perhaps blows to their identity of being British, which they feel are being administered, dealt by the significant immigration from the world, not just the continent of Europe. In other words, 
you know, um, other Brits just so disturbed by the changes in their communities, physical, linguistic, and so on, that for them now, enough is enough. I mean, is that a, in any sense... I, I've only lived in this country two years in the last 37, so it really is a foreign country, and I ask the question genuinely with a desire to know. Um, <coughs> would anyone like to sort of pick up this thing? Yes. Um, it's the point about immigration. I think you, you know, Europe has been visions. It's been uh, single market. It's been colliders, goats or colliders or whatever, done on an international scale. So but the trouble is people in the street... They'll buy into that when everything's going smoothly. And I think one of the problems that Europe has is, an eco is a democratic deficit. Is you don't know, as an individual, I don't think, how to change the direction. And when something like immigration comes up, there isn't the mechanism to say, hang on, I know we kind of bought into the single market, but now I see the effects in we speech or whatever. And how do people affect that. There is no Democratic and Republican Party at a European level that you can say, oh, I vote for this or I vote for that. So we, at the moment we're in this sort of pork barrel politics where people go, Cameron goes and says, I've come back with, um, I've negotiated some money for the UK. But that's not really the issue to me. It's the issue is what is the democratic process? that means that people have a say in the direction of Europe. And I'll also say it's a timing issue. Because it's going so fast, things like immigration, when they pop up, people start to go, ooh, hang on a second, I didn't buy into this. So maybe it's just in 50 years' time, all of these things will get solved. But the trouble is, and maybe it's a good thing to see what's happening, is they bubble up and you get... You know, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, let me, just following up from something you're saying, perhaps somebody else might have a view. Um, why is immigration, you mentioned Whiz Beach, I have no idea where it is, but I mean, uh, as an example, but what, why um, is immigration naturally perceived as a bad thing for Whiz Beach rather than a positive thing? Because this seems to be a lot of the spin that's on it. You know, that immigrants, uh, we don't want them because they're not doing us any good. I mean, is that at all a set, a, a set of attitudes you, you recognise? I think we're bouncing around the subjects here, aren't we? It's all very good for us here to sit there and you can get 189 billion. There's great big swathes of society, both the young and the poor, that aren't seeing any benefit from that. And so they're being told it's creating this money. Where is it going to? And I think immigration is just a kind of a, an area that, with speech, by the way, I think it's got something like, is it 60% immigrants? So it's so overwhelming, the immigration, that's effective. But I talk to my mother-in-law, I talk to the poorer members of society who come from elsewhere, and they say all their friends, their grandchildren can't get jobs. Mm. The immigrants are coming in, they're trained, they're graduates, they're doing non, you know, relatively unskilled jobs. And so they turn around and they say, no, all of this benefits, all of, which I actually have to say I was surprised at how little it was that left to go, the 1% or 1.5%. Where is it going? And so I think it's all very well for all us privileged devils in here to say, oh, it all looks very good, very positive. But there's a lot of people out there which are poor. The, um, sorry, just a point of correction. The, the 189 billion is a prospective gain, right? Yes, so, you yeah, potentially. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you, well, if you look at geographical inequity within the, within, the, uh, within the EU, if you look at the youth, um, I mean, you've picked up the youth, the youth part is a problem everywhere within the EU. There are great big swathes of the whole EU, and in the UK, we are just not seeing any benefit of this quote-unquote prosperity. Yeah. I'd be cynical yeah. if I was young and poor. Question. Yes, well, listen. To me, one of the, the difficulties of this debate, uh, one of the difficulties of doing, <laughs> uh, can I take the. Uh, Special privilege. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, I, I think one of the difficulties of the debate is it's, it's not the macroeconomic issues, uh, nor the uh, security, peace and security issues. It's going to define, of course, 
of debate. It's going to be something more aligned to the uh, microeconomic issues, but even more importantly, the individual saying, am I better or worse off by staying in the European community? And it's also not a long or short-term issue. It's very much a short-term issue rather than a long-term issue. And so I think that immigration is one aspect of that, but I think the fundamental question comes down to the, to the fact of, am I going to be better off uh, voting for remaining in the Euro uh, European community is my, uh, are my children? Uh, and I'm not going to find the answers by going to the internet. There's so much uh, sort of mm -hmm. conflicting uh, information. Uh, and uh, to me, and I throw it out to the panel, uh, to me, the only solution to this is what I call statesmanship. Uh, politicians staying up and standing up and saying, you know, this is the right thing. It may, uh, it may not mean uh, a great deal to you uh, uh, today or tomorrow, but for the future of this country, uh, we have to take a certain direction. And uh, I, but I'm very concerned, very worried about the direction of the debate at the moment, because there are very few people willing to stand up and put their head above the parapet and uh, uh, take a uh, less than uh, politic politically advantageous. I mean, let's turn that around to, to Julia. Um, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it possible that a referendum actually campaign would be a very good idea? Um, one thinks back to 75, when uh, the, uh, the beginning of that campaign, the figures um, were pretty roughly 60% for pulling out of Europe, 35% for staying in, and the result was exactly the reverse of that. Uh, and I've always understood, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, that part of the reason for that was that it was a cross-party uh, campaign in favour of staying in. Um, uh, a referendum, to pick up the point, gentleman's point, would obviously require senior politicians to take positions, which might actually be helpful. Rather than the experience of the Scottish referendum, the Scottish referendum leaves me slightly concerned that the mainstream political leaders will leave it too late, and in some ways have left it too late, that the Eurosceptics began their campaign to withdraw the day after the 75 referendum. They just chipped away, and it's grown very much since the Maastricht Treaty of 1992. But I think there has been a momentum to the Eurosceptic campaign, including, as we said earlier, the print media, that absolutely wasn't there in the 1970s. The Yes campaign had the lion's share of resources in 75, that may not be the case now. So a referendum might be useful, but it does need that real political leadership that isn't being, being shown, wasn't really shown over the Scottish referendum. The idea that 10 days out you suddenly say, oh, this is what we're going to offer, we haven't thought about it before, but we'll all agree, actually doesn't demonstrate statesmanship. It demonstrates politicians not, demonst not giving sufficient thought not having vision or strategy. So a referendum could be useful, but we need our political leaders really to stop and think very hard about what they're doing and do something that, so far, very few of them have achieved for many years. Thank you. Um, we're very nearly out of time, um, and despite my best efforts, it has been very much a Britain and Europe conversation. Um, Marco and um, Nikki, uh, is there anything you would wish to say about this British conversation? And, and indeed, what kind of resonance you think it has cross borders? Um, yes. And to what extent, actually, do you think, from your knowledge of the rest of Europe, which is extensive, to what extent uh, are British Eurosceptics, Danish Eurosceptics, Finnish Eurosceptics, um, French Eurosceptics, to what extent are they all singing from the same songbook? What I feel is that there is a Eurocentrism <laughs> which doesn't really cover all members of Europe. For example, there is a divide between the North and the South, uh, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Greeks and us Cypriots do not feel exactly like the Germans and the, and the French and the British. And what surprises me is that Besides this divide that seems to be cultural, but I'm not very sure if it's only cultural, there is the other thing which says, uh, why is it that some people in, in certain countries benefit more? And the question you put is very important because we see in all European countries, despite the divide, 
we have an abstinence from, from the elections, from European elections. Every year, even in the so-called uh, countries of, of Central Europe, Germany and France, and in, in other countries of the South, like us, we don't vote in Europe anymore. We don't vote for Europe. And this is a question people put to themselves. Last time in Cyprus, I, w I was sure that there would be a greater percentage of people who didn't turn up for the European elections. Why? Because when you don't live well within a conglomeration or an organization, why should you go? It doesn't concern you anymore. So it is a matter of, of, of putting together all our brains. Why is there a divide? Why is there a center? We shouldn't, be called, we shouldn't have a center. We shouldn't have Germany and France. We should have a, a kind of solidarity among people. And this is what uh, I've been to other conferences on the same thing. And Habermas, the great uh, philosopher, was there. He's German. And uh, he was stressed by Spaniards and Greeks. And, and it was acknowledged by Habermas himself that uh, there isn't enough solidarity between people. And that, that is a procedure that is going to take time. What I am afraid is that terrorism and nationalism and racism is getting roots in our countries. Even small countries like us, we see immigrants and they say, ah, oh, they came to Cyprus and our children are leaving to go abroad and we have immigrants uh, from other countries. So we have to move fast in favor of Europe. We have to do things for Europe. Marco, last word, I think I'm the first one. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, as this gentleman pointed out, I think on the aggregate level, we can always speak about gains that we have from further integration and so on. But on a more micro level, the distribution within of these gains might be completely different. So in, in, in that case, maybe young people are, are losing just because the policies that, that would be needed um, here to actually support them if and we have rising immigration um, are not there. So there's, I think there's action on, on, on the policy level. The policymakers should actually um, start to think about how they actually could communicate potential benefits um, to their citizens. And I think this is one of, of, of big lag that we have at the moment, it's just politicians are not able to do that. Yes. On the other side, I think it's also very important to to tailor a message, um, because it's, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, to tell a um, Erasmus student that Europe is, is, has benefits is, is, is not a big deal, but if you want to um, speak to a, let's say, low-skill factory worker um, somewhere in East London, eh, not East London, sorry, <laughs> in East in the East UK, it's, it's more difficult to explain what are the potential benefits of, of, of integration. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Can I make a question? Can I put a question to you, to anybody? Why is it? Is, is a sign of malaise the fact that politicians, local politicians, feel that they don't participate so much anymore, that some of their political strength has been taken away? And they really don't matter so much, or they don't do enough. Is the power taken away, and it's centralized in Brussels? So they feel, they, you know, they can sort of sit back and you know do their time, because they know they'll be voted next time or the, the time after, and they don't do enough. But I, I really feel that politicians are feeling us. I know several people actually hold that view that. Uh that, uh, if you like, part of the movement towards repatriate powers yes. is being supported by politicians who aware, are aware and cannot fail to be aware that their national parliaments don't have exactly. the powers of themselves. Exactly. Um, but in fact, I mean, um, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up there because I think my instructions were just closed about <laughs> 10 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> but it has, it, it has actually been, you know, uh, I hope you'll find your agreement has been very interesting, very informative. Um, uh, and a bit of fun, and um, uh, one doesn't usually associate the word fun with the European Union, um, often enough. Well, I know it's fun for you and me, but we're nerds. Um, uh, I, think, I think the three members of our panel, I hope you agree with me, have done a, a really seriously good job, and uh, in difficult circumstances. 
Um, and you yourselves, thank you for your participation, your questions and your comments. Um, we could have gone on for another several hours, I'm sure, but um, exhaustion would set in eventually. So I think that uh, I, I can ask you to thank the panel and uh, remind you that there's a drink outside, right, right? John, can, uh, uh, just on behalf of the university, can I just say yeah, thank you yeah. to you and to all the panel members, Julia, Nikki, and Marcus, uh, you are. I'm just going to close with one thought. Three weeks ago, um, I was visiting the University of Bialystok. Now, that is a city which formerly was almost in what would have been considered in the 1930s well embedded in Central Europe. It's now 20 kilometers from the Belarusian border. The perspective and debates that we were having, this is part of a collaboration that's been set up with the Institute of Criminology here and Bialystok as part of the, uh, the uh, format of the debate, was very interesting. Because everything you've mentioned here were exactly the same fears that people have there. It's several thousand miles away from us, but the problems are the same. Immigration. Um, yeah, it's not the immigration we have here. It's actually Belarusians, it's Russians, it's Ukrainians, it's others coming over their boundaries. They're just as concerned with the same problems and worry about what's happening to their young people, which they're equating about going on to the uh, uh, moving to, to Europe. So we're not alone in Britain in, in facing some of these problems. And then you have isolationist groups, like I was visiting in Budapest with the Hungarians, which in essence want to be, go it alone. They're now seeing the problem that particularly in the science and technology area, nobody wants to collaborate with them. Mm. Because in essence, they're thinking too small. And yes, the Wisbeach question is a very real question. The problem is also, unfortunately, one on the other side, is it's difficult to define what Europe is what are we actually if we're not European when you put it in the context of North America and China? If you want to be the nut in the nutcracker, just get rid of Europe. So for me, the cost of non-Europe is it's a very uncomfortable place to be. So on behalf of the university, thank you for coming. Thank you for the debate and thank you for the really interesting questions. And John, as always, thank you for a wonderful chairing of this. And it's wine outside and I hope the discussions can continue. Thank you. Thank you, panel.